So I see a lot of internal functions going, they have a problem and we know what it is. If they don't see it as a problem and can't say it, just stop right there. Just stop. Don't go try to convince them that it's a problem if they don't feel it. Um, The problem also can't be they're not using our thing. Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, (laughs) it's their problem, not your problem. That's very Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I'm Rodney Evans, and that guy, the man in black, is Sam Sperlin. Hello, Rodney Evans. Welcome back to Outwork with Ready, Sam and everybody. Uh, This is a podcast about modernizing organizations as the present moment meets the future of work. Each episode, we turn our attention to one common organizational pattern that we think is worth digging into. We pull it apart like digging a pearl out of a clam and propose ideas for what to do instead. Um, Do pearls come out of clams, Sam? Oh, shoot. Oysters. No, where do do pearls come from? (laughs) Uh, spoiler alert, it's not clams. Uh, You're thinking of chowder. (laughs) Well, okay. Pull it apart, like making chowder out of clams. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. You know, we'll workshop it for next week. Okay. So far away from the ocean. I don't know. So far from an oyster. Um, yeah, they do come from oysters. Uh, so that's a new thing that you learned today. It sure Uh, is. We're going to make you regret the pull apart meme, Uh, but that's not what we're talking about today. We're really excited. This is just like Ben in the air and the water and the zeitgeist lately. We're going to be talking about what it actually means to have a product mindset um, and how it's different than what mostly we see out there, even though it's what like every company is um, banging the drum about right now. So before we do that, Sam... Let's check in. Should we have a seafood related check in? It's like a quiz. It's like, what's a muscle? Well, I mean, maybe, maybe we should. Uh, although this check in question that I set, you know, hours ago is mm. somewhat relevant. I'm ready. What is something related to your craft that you've recently learned or relearned? Ooh, my craft. Mm-hmm. I love this I question. Deliberately, Can you go deliberately first? broad. I'm happy to go first. Okay. Uh, other than where pearls come from. Uh-huh. Important. Uh, I think something that I'm I'm always relearning is that I'm better at this work when I'm a little bit more toward kind of the intense side of a continuum that maybe has intensity and like chill on the other end. Mm. If I'm a, a little bit I'm more on the intense side, I think I just show up much better and I am at – better service to our clients and I had better ideas and I'm just like more engaged. But in order for me to do that, I have to take very seriously, deliberately disengaging with the work on a daily or other sort of rhythm um, basis. Otherwise I can never really tap into that. And I'm always at this kind of lower, um, lower state of energy that I'm bringing to the work. Mm, Interesting. Um, I think that what I have been relearning uh, in the last six months or so is I think in my role is really important. And we've talked about this on the show, but um, I've been very focused on some macro level work for the ready. And what's interesting is that was a shift from earlier when there was like a lot of foundational just you know, pothole filling to do. But, but what I'm relearning right in this moment, because a couple of things that I've been focused on just in the last week is like, I really am the best at this work when I am also paying really close attention to the external environment. So, um, there have been a couple of pretty significant trends percolating and, and some pretty big things like happening, um, like on the global economic stage that I just, uh, was not really engaging in to the extent that I should be for the job that I sit in to be smart on, um, you know, being, as you would say, ahead of the puck in terms of the future of work. So I think what I'm recent, what I'm relearning right now is like, it's not enough to just be working at the strategic level of the ready. I need to really also, in order to do that well, be paying attention to a much, much, much wider environment, um, which is just easy to negotiate away from when there's a lot on. Yeah. 
Yeah, totally. And I appreciate you putting it into terms that I'll understand. Yeah, no problem. I always forget. <laughs> if you could go ahead and just use only hockey metaphors for this entire no episode, problem. that would be great. No problem. I will, I will do my best. Um, I will do my best. So I'm like trying to think of one now. I'm not going to do that because it'll just be a mess. The wheels, I know. The wheels turning on basically <laughs> no content. Yeah. Uh, so. Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know there are boards and fights. Uh, that's all I got. You got the basics. Yeah, that's, that's what hockey's like. <laughs> um, so the organizational pattern that we're going to dig into today is this idea that a lot of organizations have in their strategy or their um, values or their plans that they want to do something like adopt a product mindset, um, put the customer at the center of the experience, something be customer centric, something like that, you know, user centered design. I hear this in lots of different places, both in terms of the external customer and in terms of the internal customer for functions that are more um, like in the center of an organization. But what we often see is that the OS that they're working in actually puts the opinions and the agendas and the desires of the leaders at the center. Like that's really what is being designed for in terms of how the work gets done. Um, yeah. And and usually when the customer's centricity is declared, but the leader opinion centricity is serviced, um, you only get the leader one. Yeah. And with time and reps, you have an ever increasing need for the customer centricity because right. the leader opinion thing is like sucking up the resources and the time and the roadmap and, 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 and so the customer gets left behind, which means then you have catching up to do. Right. So said simply, we say we want product, but we actually do is leader focus, which increases our need for customer focus. Love it. So I'm going to do the rare thing and hearken back to our relevant check-in round. And I'm Ooh. going to just play the tiniest little bit of, of devil's advocate and say, Ronnie, in your check-in round, you described, you know, you being a leader in this organization, staying super connected to what's happening in the environment. Why, why not design around your opinion? It sounds like your opinion is pretty well founded and you're doing the work to have good opinions. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't think that it's either or. I think it would be really dangerous for anyone who is making any decisions about the ready to only be paying attention to the external environment and not the customer voice. And I feel like um, I generally am quite in touch with our customers. So I'm able to like braid those things together, not say we either design for this, you know, this. AI trend that I'm reading about, or we design based on what our customers are saying. If anything, I think it's our job to bring that information to our customers and help them make sense of it. So, um, so yeah, I, I think, look, I think generally what I believe and what I think is backed by the research that Jack gave us is like, if you think about there being three sources, the broad environmental source, the customer source, and the internal opinion source, I don't think that you can just do one. Like I think right. the job is always going to be to evaluate and balance and make bets informed by all three. Is my yeah. general that think. Sense. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, why don't, I, you, why don't yeah. you listen to me is another way of asking that question. <laughs> I think, first of all, I take your word as gospel in all things. Um, so Nailed it. just, you know, I guess going to sleep, listening to episodes of our podcast, I have a special feed that has just taken me out and it's just your voice. So like, I feel like I'm pretty well, well versed in the Rodney verse at this point. Um, no, but I, I, I my, my devil's ad advocacy there was very, very slight and, and mostly fake um, because I think it's really easy uh, I think a leader with an ego, a large ego, can take that question that I guess asked and be like, you know what, you're right. I am doing yeah. a great job, and oh. we should do what what I what I'm thinking about. Right. And that's not that's not what you said. And I just think anytime we're dealing with a lot of complexity, uh, which 
basically all organizations exhibit. I just get very skeptical of one person being the receptacle or the container of all of that complexity and yeah. trusting that what comes out the other side is the best thing that that could happen. Yeah. Tangent, slight tangent, but you really made me yes. think about this. Um, Cause a lot of, a lot of companies that we work with, I would not put in the category of like the most progressive organizations, Sure, but the ready is a progressive organization. And so what you saying that just made me think about is like, if I think sort of about the order of operations for someone who's steer, who's stewarding something that is progressive in nature, I think the move is like, I want to know like where the world is heading so that we can be edgy in that knowing that like our customers will not be mm -hmm. and, and not expecting to like drag them into the future. But, but I feel like I want the world to inform our perspective on where the puck is headed and us to inform our customers perspective on where the puck is headed. And the only way to do that is to like balance all the things. That makes sense. That's cool. Your question like just made me attention. think about that. Yeah. I never like, th I, yeah. you know, I've never really thought about it before, but like, it would be cool to, it, it will be cool for me based on this conversation to think a little bit more like specifically about that and what that means yeah. in terms of what I consume and what I do with it. So yeah. thank you, cool. Sam, for doing You're something so smart welcome. and helpful within the first <laughs> two minutes of the podcast. Well, speaking of smart, let's pull apart this clam and try to find a pearl. <laughs> let's uh, pull this clam apart. My goodness. <laughs> What's what are the what's so what are the, the various aspects in play here when we talk about this this pattern that you elucidated for us? Like what how do you how do you think about it? I mean, the main thing that I think about, the main problem that I see, and this is particularly true for infrastructure functions, but it can be true for product organizations as well. I have definitely seen this in large companies, is that for a variety of reasons that I'd like to brainstorm with you we get into the mindset of like, we have a solution that we're convicted about and now we just need to find a problem for it to solve. Yeah. And I think some of that is because of like expertise. Some of it is because of our own opinion. Some of it is because um, we, you know, don't have good feedback loops. Probably some of it is just like sunk cost, actual yep. sunk cost and sunk cost fallacy too. But, um, but too often what I see in a variety of different situations is like, I got this hammer, where the fuck be the nails? Because I yeah. need to go do something with it. And and then the yeah. job also, and my comp and my metrics and my like promotions and my very existence are based on my ability to convince others that they have nails, which just yeah. is like backwards. Yeah, you, it, it becomes an exercise of, I need to go do things with this thing we have made or this expertise that I have developed. And luckily for me, in, in the organization, we probably focus quite a bit on outputs. So there's yeah. lots of nails or quasi nails for me to go find or screws that I can pretend are nails and go pump some, some metrics, some, some output metrics that will allow me to continue playing the game um, for the next quarter or the quarter after that. And at that point we're doing, a, a, we're pl we truly are playing a, a game at that point and not doing what I think is truly difficult, which is required if you want to have, if you want to bring a product mindset to this work, which is thinking in terms of outcomes and really understanding what value is for our customers, for internal customers. That is often unglamorous, cognitively difficult work that is hard to make this, the time and space for in most organizations because we have this very visible game of output metrics to be playing. I think that's exactly right. And what you're making me think about is just that even if we can orient toward outcomes that we want, we still have to hold the path there really lightly in order to actually have a product mindset. And like, as, as someone who has brought stuff to market and worked with clients who do that, um, first of all, there's a lot of pressure to be right. So when you're like, I have a thing that I want to make and sell, 
out there, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it does get metric and it does get outputted. And all of the things that you're saying, I think, creep in for product teams almost immediately. And often because of that kind of constraint, there's not a lot of flexibility for like, just being really surprised by what users do with it or how it resonates or what, you know, like um, we're having this experience right now with depth finding where we're in all of these conversations. And to be honest, the thing that I thought was the killer app of depth finding is turning out to not be the killer app of depth finding. And what's cool is there is a killer app, but I'm wrong about it. Now, because I am, I don't know, constituted this way, I'm like, great, as long as there is something that has the impact that we want and gets the users the outcomes that they want, I don't give a fuck. But but in a lot of organizations, you do very much have to give a fuck because it's not cool to be wrong, even if you're getting the outcome that was intended. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I think there is an element of just like, that's like who you are. I think there's probably, you know, it, it, it helps in, in, in the, in terms of like the position that you hold at the ready as well sure. too, to be like, yeah, like, all right, that's fine. Like we'll figure it out. And I have a lot of empathy for folks who are not, you know, stewards of their team, of their organization, trying to bring that, uh, that idea forward that isn't ironclad at that point and it might fail see all episodes we've ever done on psychological safety and trust and experimentation and and how you get cultures that uh support those things right totally totally and it's like i don't know i think part of having a real product mindset that's exciting is like if you can have loosely held opinions about what the thing that you're making is for and could do it's very exciting to see people use shit in like creative and unexpected ways. Um, as long as your job and compensation is not predicated on them using it the way that you wrote in the technical documentation that they were supposed to. Right. Yeah. And if your OS is that, then, I mean, that's Uh where we have to like start to unpack, uh, some, some stuff. And, you know, I think people generally, generally, act quite rationally and you can analyze what is going on in an organization by just following the money, following the incentives, following the punishment. And, and I think people's behaviors often, you always have to leave a little bit of wiggle room for the, just, uh, the non-rationality of the human being to just do weird stuff because we do that sometimes. But in general, I think, we can we can uh, figure out why people are acting the the way uh, the way they are, and and not to immediately get into like starting to improve things, but it's not enough to just say we are now product led and right. actually you know looking at compensation and other things that are getting in the way from being able to do that. Totally, I mean, I am curious what else you see out there because I do feel like to your point. A lot of companies, and you know, I see this in HR functions, I see this in other kinds of enablement functions. Um, this sort of like we want to have a more platform mentality and you know, be creating things that our users really want. Like, so so I say that because I do feel like the explicit intention is there. And then what do you see happen? Yeah, I think I, 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 quite a few different things come to mind for me. And the first one is just wanting to be helpful. And we talked, I think, a lot about this Mm -hmm. with the future of HR stuff and how to try to get HR out of this service uh, mindset. Um, And, you know, you can, you could probably squint at this and be like, what do you mean, like, to not be of service? Like, you're an internal service organization that's supposed to be helping people. I have a thing that I need help with. What do you mean you can't? you can't help me. And I think that's a very real, a very real thing, especially if there's a long history of this function or this team, just kind of dropping everything and giving this white glove service to anybody who shows up with a problem or any senior leader who shows up with uh, a problem. Right. Right. Totally. I mean, I was in a workshop not that long ago where this was under discussion and uh, a guy I thought like very 
courageously was just like, yeah, it's all fine and good until like somebody with a certain title calls and then it's stop, drop and roll. Like that's the deal. Yeah. I think that, I think that's a very, a very real and felt thing by a lot of people. And as we always talk about, it's not one thing or the other. It doesn't have to be binary. It doesn't have to be, you are a complete service organization. You don't kind of fix things as they come up or help people as they come up, or you are purely product and people are only interacting with you through this kind of durable product that you have created, especially in any time of transition, that's a whole continuum to be explored uh, and kind of managed over time. I'm actually, when I think about this idea of having a product mindset, I'm actually more interested in it from an employee experience perspective mm. um, and internal teams adopting this this mindset. I have been I have been periphery to or I guess on the edge of a lot of very, very large organizations that seemingly hate their employees by what they force them to do or use uh-huh. on uh-huh. the inside. Uh-huh. And I can't help but think that there is real psychic damage happening within these organizations every time somebody has to open up this half-assed tool to go do a thing that they really shouldn't even need to do and doing that multiple times every day or a couple times a week like that those sorts of of things are where i'm actually most curious about how to how to change that dynamic i mean i think that like the conversations that i'm privy to are very similar to like from the ivory tower to the external environment is like from the internal function to the internal customer, which is basically like someone or some small group basically being like, we know what they want and we'll make it for them. That's it. And now it's on a roadmap and now we're metric against it. And now that's what you're getting paid for. And like, And like, we'll do a, we'll do an employee engagement survey and see it's like, dude, there is nothing about that. That makes sense. If, if what you actually want to your point is employees who feel like they are consumers of an organization that is putting them at the center, like, and I I think, you know, I think employee experience is another buzzword that gets thrown around a lot and it ends up looking like sort of like bullshitty, like listening tours and surveying and data driven or whatever. And, and the reality is like, usually that's still some sort of like concentration and some sort of powerful group deciding what the masses want and not really checking the efficacy of those decisions. And tooling is a great example of that. Yeah. Now, tooling is always just the most felt one because every time I'm working with a client and I'm using one of their laptops and I have to like interact with their IT help, that is, always tells me a lot of like, like what is this organization like? like am, am, if I call their IT help as an external contractor working to get help with my company issued laptop, like how does that go? Yeah. And sometimes it goes really well and it makes me not afraid to like open my laptop and get in there and like do work on, on their systems. And other times it's like, I'm going to have to set aside an entire day yep. to get this very simple thing fixed. And I, I can't, I, I just, I just can't, and I'm going to find something else to do. And yeah. That I think is a very real thing that people are experiencing in, in organizations. And if and if that is the case, you're going to try to stay as small and default as possible to not cause problems because anytime a problem is caused, you're setting aside a day to like go get something fixed. And I'm not throwing IT under the bus. It's just a very visible felt um, one for me personally, I guess. Totally. But like counter argument when I worked in a large organization, those were basically like days off. Good point. <laughs> and Good like my point. day-to-day was so shitty that the day when my laptop started working and I had to like, or stopped working work and I had to deal with IT yeah. and you just like dash off an email being like, sorry, everybody. And everybody was just like, well, sh- that's it. That's it for Rodney yeah. today. Cause we so all day. know how this goes. She's going to the basement, you know? Um, yeah. Those days were the shit because like, they were boring and stupid rather than being stressful and stupid. And uh, they were like a little, a little brain vacation, which probably again, tells you more about the traditional OS of like full of like nonsense jobs than anything else. Yeah. 
I guess I'm I'm just the naive idiot over here being like, we could design a better way of giving you a little brain break than just having it be horrible to get your laptop fixed. Totally. What do also, I, like, what do I you're know? someone who, like, gets to do good work and, like, That's has true. a lot of control over it and probably, like, also feels like, I mean, I feel like this at, at the ready, also feels like I can determine, like, when my work is done and when my day is done and I'm not, like punching a clock or doing yeah. politics or whatever. So, you know, all of the incentives are different for us. Anyway, That's very true. we digress. It is a great, I mean, I would put, you know, I would put benefits into this category. I would put a lot of DEI work into this category. I would put a lot of like, um, you know, when I look at expense systems that people have to use out there in the world that are like impossible to navigate in order to get reimbursed until they just give up. Um, you know, these kinds of things like d- definitely do not feel user centered or yeah. product oriented. Um, it just feels like somebody made a decision and everybody else just has to kind of like suck it up. Yeah. And it, I mean, I think it is pretty easy to kind of follow that line of thinking to well, this is a cost center and we are going to minimize the cost center of aspect of this. So give me the cheapest option. Hey, we don't need any designers to pull together this internal tool. The engineers, the software developers can just hack something together. And now we have a functional thing. And I think, you know, back to that idea of, of psychic damage, it's hard to put a monetary uh, um, uh, amount on. Totally. But it, it's a cost. It is a it's real a huge cost. cost. And it just of because course. it doesn't show up on a, a budget spreadsheet somewhere doesn't mean that it's not actively harming the organization. Totally. I totally agree. I mean, I I know a, a woman who does like fractional CHRO stuff, and she often talks about the metric of like lifetime value created by an employee. And that like, that's the metric that HR should look at and how like HR should be creating products that increase every employee's value and ability to create value and not in a shitty, like what's the ROI on every one of these people, but it's like, is HR providing the benefits to these people that make them able to do their job really well or, or to manage people really easily or to access development opportunities really seamlessly. And she like thinks of this in this very smart and customer centric way. And like, she was telling me once that like when she goes into, she works a lot with scaling startups. And when she goes into a company, like the first thing she looks at is basically what they're paying for their benefits stack versus what employees are using. And she just rips out all of the cost of the un used resources and she's like this is not good investment in terms of employee value so like redeploy this capital to something that your customers who are your employees will actually use and give a shit about and will make them better totally and i think what is kind of connecting all of these ideas is that at the end of the day if you want to take a more product focused approach to literally everything your organization does What's hard about it is that it creates, it can create some very stark realities that uh-huh. we have to deal with because uh-huh. product, yeah, we, we got to say, if, if we're, if we're staying product focused, we're staying very close to our customer and truly listening to what their, their challenges are. We are truly looking at metrics related to the things that we are building and maybe being forced to look at the fact that the thing we spent a lot of money and time on is not actually creating the value that we thought we are having to do have some really tough conversations about what value even is for us and who contributes to it and who is getting in the way or what is getting in the way of creating that value and all of this is just it's very, it can be very stark. I don't want to say black or white or binary because it's, 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 uh, it's not like everything here is, is we're dealing with, with scales of, of intensity, but it's like real shit to talk about. And it can be a lot easier to set up a kind of a, a work sandbox and just let people go play over there. Like make your presentations, we'll do our meetings and, at the end of the day, the leaders will just say what we have to make, and we can just play the game of work in this in this artificial environment, or we can do the real thing, which 
is going to cause probably some conflict. It's going to hurt feelings. There's going to be weird ego stuff showing up. But at the end of the day, you are making something that you're proud of and that people are actually using. So like, are we willing to make that trade off or, or yeah. not? Yeah. And like, I, I think it's such an important point and not one to be under emphasized because we were talking about this actually in the founder mode episode. It takes so much belief to actually create something with your point of view. You know, it like, it takes a lot of fuel to, for an HR team to be like, this is the new comp system or for the finance team to be like, this is the new way we do budgeting or for a product team to be like, this is the new feature that we're going to deploy. Like it takes a lot. And, and so ginning up all that energy and, um, and belief and time and probably initial research and then holding it lightly enough that when you're wrong, you can just be like, whoops, pivot is um like that's not easy that's not easy to do no yeah it's 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 definitely not and it's just so much easier i guess most organizations are not set up to where you can really love the problem totally uh, totally and, and really get deep into like what is really going on here what are we actually trying to do um that is like that is truly time intensive and energy intensive and attentional intensive work to be done. And I mean, look at any of our clients and their typical calendars, like where is that work happening? It's, it's not. Uh, right. And yet we have to kind of pretend that it is in order to keep, keep things moving. Yeah. And this, Again, like tiny side tangent, but this makes me think about a lot of conversations I have about metrics also, which is like, usually when we look at metrics and when our clients look at metrics, they want to look from the perspective of like, is this good or not good? And if it's bad, what should we do? And there's so little time and space to like, Real, first of all, really understanding, like really understanding whatever the numbers are that are driving our business and maybe some numbers that we don't typically look at, giving us enough time to like really marinate in that as a group, not just be like, it's green or it's red, what's next? And then starting to be like, what does this tell us? What does yeah. this mean? What is the story of these numbers? How is that story different than the anecdotal stories that we hear? How is that story different than what our customers are experiencing? It's very rare to see teams that make the space to do that and don't sort of rush to like just finishing, just like we looked at the metrics, we checked the box, we moved on to what's next. And instead really being like, really having time for the sense making to your point about loving the problem. Yeah. Yeah. We, well, we just got to get stuff done, Rodney. We got to execute. I know. It's all about we got to execute. We got to just keep, <laughs> keep going, keep going forward. And I feel like that is also, you know, I've worked in internal functions in companies. Like, I feel like it's pretty rare to get real data on how you're doing. Like, I don't ever remember like a finance person asking me if, uh, if well, like, how was budgeting this year? You get what you yeah. needed? Yeah. Like, did you get what you <laughs> needed from budgeting? Like, did yeah. that, was that, or like, you know, I didn't, when I was an HR person, I pretty rarely asked my clients for really specific feedback. Right. And when yeah. I did, it was basically like service oriented. Like, am I a good partner to you? Do you trust yeah. me? Like, do you want me around? I mean, you know, not exactly, but kind of, it wasn't yeah. like, did we solve the most compelling problems that your business had this year? Cause the answer would have been no, like <laughs> right, hundred percent. I'm sure. So, um, I just, you know, you had put in a point about like feedback loops and yeah, I just don't think that we hear a lot because we don't really ask our customers internally. Um, yeah. The, the questions that I'm talking about. Yeah, because they're hard. They're hard to hear if yeah. you're if, if especially 
if you're kind of early in a, in a process where we're trying to do more feedback and you don't have years of like taking what maybe others would <laughs> Take perceive it in as, the face. As, <laughs> as, as difficult feedback, yeah. um, like it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't feel great. And then if you're then um, enmeshed in an OS where you can't really do anything with that feedback, like right. why, why am I going to solicit a bunch of shit I can't do anything with? So like, right. let's just operate under the assumption that if nobody tells me anything, it means I'm doing an amazing job, uh, totally. which is just easier to, to kind of operate with that fiction. Totally. Uh, can I take us on a slight right turn to like, it's a more tactical thing that I think take about with this. Take us on a turn, Sam. I've been waiting so, all my life for you to just <laughs> take us yeah, on a turn. That's right. So having a product mindset, product centricity, whatever you want to call it, Building products is a inherently cross-functional endeavor. Truth. Um, and in a lot of organizations, doing doing anything cross-functionally is death. Yeah, it's not so possible. <laughs> let's not let's not orient ourselves around a fundamental idea that makes us do a thing that we're bad at and we hate. Uh, mm, and I think that's one of the reasons why people don't want to operate in in this way, or they want to yeah. talk about it. But when the reality is, we're sitting around a table with my cross functional partners to do something, it goes poorly because we don't have working agreements, we don't have a history of working well together, we have a bunch of history of probably actively not working well uh, together. Right. And there's like just the whole basket of things around cross functional collaboration that seems to be a prerequisite or something that needs to be worked on in parallel with any sort of effort of trying to take a more product centric approach to anything that an organization is doing. I totally agree. And also like when you work cross-functionally in an organization, you're immediately opening yourself up to the kind of difficult feedback that we're talking about. Like right. if you're going to be sitting in a PMO and you're like, I'm going to really bring together a bunch of folks to figure out what the workflow should be around managing this portfolio. Like pretty quickly, you're going to hear from a bunch of people about how your best practice is not good for them or what they yeah. want or meeting their needs. So it's like, it is easier if you are sitting in the PMO to just like get all the other project managers together and be like, shall we? looks good yeah. you know like yeah. uh, high fives get the fuck out of here when you bring like the supply chain guy in and he is like yeah what you're doing is extra work it's a tax on my day job it adds no value to me and i understand that it's just in service of people who aren't doing any of this work like nobody wants to hear that yeah no no not at all and i think if you're if you're not having this product centric approach and you're kind of stuck in a more service mindset, being surrounded with your functional friends slash allies, like there's there's uh, what company and misery, misery and company. Like if you are all burnt out because you're all servicing in an insane amount of requests every day, but like you're all in it together, I think you can create. I don't know, this like self-perpetuating identity around like we're burned out, we're martyrs, we're like doing everything. And, you know, that's this is just our reality and people don't don't understand us. Totally. Well, and I think that this is like a really fine point to put on this whole pattern, which is when we do what you're describing when we insulate ourselves from the end user's experience and perspective, what is very easy to do is cast the end user as an idiot. Yeah. And yeah. that's fine, I guess, except like who is it helping really to have an amazing product that no one can use? And, you know, again, having worked inside and around a lot of internal functions, like it is a protection mechanism to just yeah. be like, my greatness is misunderstood. And if these people knew what I know, then they would use what I made. And also who fucking cares? Like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It just doesn't yeah. matter. And TBH, I think like we fell into this a little bit already. I think there was a time that we 
on occasion would be a little like precious about our ways of working and our convictions and our defaults and, 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 and it's like good on paper, but if the clients, if good on paper and good in practice, but only if you have a dance partner who will practice. Right. And if the clients are just like, cool, you show yourself out or like, then it doesn't matter. And, and I think that like, this is the biggest shift is like, your idea doesn't matter. The potential impact doesn't matter if the person who has to use it won't. Exactly. And we have to decide, do we care about that or not? Do we care about having a business? I mean, that well, is a question. Yeah, I guess I was thinking more internally. Um, I uh-huh. mean, even, even, yeah, I, mean, I think externally as well, but even internally, you know, do we, we have to decide like, cause you can, you can fake a lot of this. We can like, this is just back to that sandbox idea. We can play the game of work and all be very busy all day long, but right. not actually be providing a whole lot of value. And either we're just getting lucky in the market conditions that are allowing us to survive. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't like bet the long term success of the organization on us just being able to skate by with because of external conditions that we are somehow able to take advantage of. Totally. And like, I'm realizing as we're talking about this, you know, like I held a role where I was such a perpetrator of this. I cannot even tell you where like my job was to have ideas and to understand the thinking in a field and create material from that, et cetera, et cetera. And the internal users of that basically didn't want it. Yeah. And I was basically like, you're stupid. And like, that's not, right. that's right. not helpful. And when, um, and like, first of all, like they're not stupid, but we did suffer from like, if, if I didn't make it, then it's not X. What's the expression that people use? It's like, it's a specific, like, it might even be an acronym. Didn't build like, it here syndrome. Yes. Didn't build it yeah. here syndrome, which is like a real thing. Even when you're even when you're all working like in the same building under the same yeah. operating name, didn't build it here syndrome is still a real thing. Um, and I see it all the time. And, and I think like, you know, younger, more um, arrogant me was just like, the work will be so good that it will speak for itself and be undeniable. Right. And like elder wizened me is like, that's not how it works. <laughs> Is that what you are now? This yeah, is the I'm, elder I'm an wizened elder version wizened. Of you. Yeah, I'm a crone now. Um, real, yeah, I'm just like, Yoda that's unfortunately, energy. I think that I still think that's how it should work. And unfortunately, yeah. I know that it doesn't anymore. So it just like, you know, I feel like I just have another, I have enough reps, both in my own lived experience and with clients to know that like, that's just not how it goes. So we might as well just put that down. Yeah, totally. Uh, question for you. Has this clam well and truly been pulled apart? I th- I think Should so. Should we go look for that pearl? Do we have a pearl to offer? You talk about clams like someone who has never eaten a clam. I actually, here's the thing. I know my way around a clam. I've eaten plenty of clams. Huh. I love okay. seafood. Okay. But apparently I am not um, smart in the world of luxury jewelry. Oh, uh-huh. That's the problem, probably. Yeah, <laughs> let's uh, give the people some ideas. All right, I'll go first. I, I tried to go really specific and actionable on a couple of ideas here. So I think a uh, really valuable exercise to partake in is some value stream mapping. Ooh, and nice. there are so many different ways you can do this. You can get really complicated really quick trying to do some value stream mapping. What I'm advocating for is the truly simplest version, which is basically getting a group of people together who are aware or work on a thing and starting with on the far right, what is the value that the customer or the, you know, whether internal or external, like what is the value they are getting from the thing we are doing? And then just working your way to the left, asking yourself, well, what must be true for that to happen? 
yeah. and you start to branch everything off and you just keep following those branches back until you've built that, that chain, that map of how value is created. Then you can go back over that, that map and start to have conversations about, well, where are things harder than they should be? Where are the friction points within this map? What are the aspects of the map that we created that make no sense to us? Like, why is this whole chain even part of it? Like, let's understand that aspect of it. And I've never not gotten a bunch of really actionable and useful things out of a 90 minute value stream mapping exercise with a cross-functional team that is responsible for a thing. Nice. Yeah. Ronnie, what do, what do you have? Okay. So a lot of times what I think people are looking for, they hop right from, we want to have a product mindset to how do we get product market fit? We have a thing. We just need a market for our thing, either internally or externally. Mm -hmm. And I think there are at least two steps before that. Yeah. I think for any internal or, or product organization that's trying to make something, you need a period of time where you're just learning and gathering evidence that there is a problem worth solving. Like that yeah. is so fundamental and hearkening back to our Josh Burson episode where he and I talked about this, just like there is a real problem that problem can be articulated. We generally know who has that problem. And very importantly, and in a step that is often skipped, that customer recognizes and also articulates that problem. So I see a lot of internal functions going, they have a problem and we know what it is. If they don't see it as a problem and can't say it, just stop right there. Just yeah. stop. Don't go try to convince them that it's a problem if they don't feel it. Um, the problem also can't be. The problem also can't be they're not using our thing. Yeah, that's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's their problem, not your problem. That's a very good point, Sam, because that does actually get yeah a little squishy. The second step before you pursue product market fit is problem solution fit. So, do you have a tested and proven solution to their problem? based on their feedback, not yours, does it actually solve the problem that they say they have? And are they telling you that they would buy it? I say this constantly. You heard me say it in front of a huge group of people the other day. Like when I'm working with like, we'll call it an HR function. And they're like, yeah, our hiring process and the hiring managers won't buy and they're just not, eh, and, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, if they wouldn't buy your service when competed against that service externally, you don't have it. You don't have it. Like if it's, if you are not doing something for them that taken away, they would source elsewhere and pay for out of their budget. You do not have product market fit. And so what you need before you get there is actual problem solution fit and intent to buy. It's like, I have a problem in terms of like the medical support that I am getting right now, I don't actually have an intention to do anything about it. I know that there are solutions out there. I know what my problem is. I, I'm not going to pay to solve it right now. Like you, ha these are, these are the steps. These are sort of like the chain of custody in this thing that you have to go through before you're just like, we got product market fit. Let's scale this thing. Yeah. Totally. And one of the really difficult things about this is that there is huge, we've seen over and over and over again, huge difference um, between um, stated preference and revealed preference. So even someone saying they will pay for a thing mm -hmm. versus like actually clicking the button and putting their credit card information in, those are even quite different things. And I understand that perhaps you can't get your experiment, your test to the point where there's like literal change of value, but just it's important to be very conscious of the fact that someone telling you they will buy a thing to your face, especially if you have any sort of relationship with them versus them actually in the privacy of their own home, deciding to buy the thing are worlds apart. Totally. To this point, one of the questions that I love asking customers um, is, 
how else have you tried to solve this? And who else have you hired to solve it? Because if they're like, to your point, Sam, if they're like, um, no money and no one, it's just a thing that I think about when I'm walking my dog. Like that's not it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You got one more? No, I think we should, I think we should just wrap here. Let's wrap wrap it. Let's wrap it up. This is good. We found that, we found that pearl, a couple of pearls actually. And now it's time to make a necklace. It's time to make a necklace and for Sam to learn about seafood. That's right. We're always looking for new topics for the show. Um, also, on the down low, I'm also looking for new pull-apart metaphors or oh, uh, ideas. Huh. So send those yeah. to me. Maybe uh, ones that are well. accurate. Maybe. As just, like, yeah. it, just as a thought starter. Exactly. Uh-huh. So if you have an organizational pattern that you're having trouble changing, shoot us a note at podcast at the This show is engineered by Taylor Marvin and produced by Jack Van Amberg, who was trolling Sam in the comments of Zencaster while we were recording. It was just an absolute delight. Uh, At Work with the Ready is created by the Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way that they work, including shifting to product mindsets. Uh, Thanks for listening. 